Now, the hard truth that a lot of developers don't love to hear is that listen, publisher, the publisher like developer dynamic is very unfair. I got time now. I'll show you. I'm going to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they got a chip thing. in their shoulder as well. Yeah, that's, that's right. the best way. Like yeah. have a creative with a chip on his shoulder, uh, his <laughs> right. shoulder, and and uh, see what see what happens. Yeah, like and so yeah. it works really well when you can do something like that, and because it's authentic, and that's what yeah. you know, especially gamers want. They don't want some bullshit marketing. Yeah, exactly. They want something that's authentic. And then just last question, like, what's one piece of advice you give others working in the industry right now with everything going on? Welcome to a new GDA episode with Ben Qualo, the founder and CEO of Midwest Games. Ben is an entertainment and video game industry leader, most recently supporting the build out of films and games for Netflix. Before Netflix, he worked on 2K and Blizzard in publishing, marketing, and technology roles. Ben has led film campaigns for Bird Box, Extraction, Army of the Dead, and over 50 other titles. He has also worked on major game franchises like NBA 2K, Borderlands, Bioshock, Civilization, Mafia, and Blizzard's Esports, having helped to publish over 100 titles. Please click on the like and subscribe buttons if you find this helpful. Thanks. Hey, Ben, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great. So what part of the world are you calling in from? Right now, I'm calling in from Green Bay, Wisconsin, right in the Tylertown District, right across from Lambeau Field. Ah, as a Bears fan, I, I have to grimace a little bit, but yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm familiar with that town. It has caused me a lot of pain, um, but yeah, that's, that's cool. Um, so what's your current title in role? Uh, so I'm the founder CEO of uh, Midwest Games. Cool. Um, Tell me more about the mission behind Midwest Games. Like, wh- what did you start? What are you doing up there? Yeah, we're trying to change where games come from by better supporting underserved developers in overlooked regions. Also, mm-hmm. trying to support a more sustainable industry and uh, trying to think about how we can make change by just ultimately approaching the problems in different ways than the industry historically has. Yeah. Yeah, because at least, you know, and this shows in 90 countries, but at least in the U.S., it's always been very West Coast centric, right? Like it's San Diego, L.A., San Fran, Seattle, you yeah. know, and it's hyper concentrated there, which is. Yeah, with one exception, you know, Austin, Texas has been the one yeah. growth outlier outside of it. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, 67%, I think, of the industry is in those three states, California, Washington, Texas. So that's right. a pretty dramatic uh, piece. I think it's, it's potentially adjusted slightly, you know, over the COVID period, but still mm-hmm. a vast majority of the industry is in those three places. And we need to diversify. And with those places being so expensive, we right. need to find alternative hubs. Because even Austin, Texas is ultimately very expensive these days. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of crazy. I was working for uh, Blue Byte Software in 98, and I had the chance to move down there because they moved from Chicago to Austin, and I turned it down, and I'm like, I could have been set up if I moved down there in 98 and bought a house back then. Yeah, that's um, true. Yeah, and what was it? Origins was down there, and they, you know, back in the 90s, they had a couple hundred people, which was insane, and people would get pissed or whatever and start their own studio, so it kind of mushroomed all these little studios grew out of that and the teams working on ultima and all that kind of stuff and it kind of it was always a silicon prairie but it kind of grew into this whole mm-hmm. community you know in some ways madison's like that right like i was up for yep. M- mdev and there's all these studios besides the big one you know raven and everything so it's it's kind yep. of cool to see these pockets growing and that's part of what i was looking at as i as i founded this company because i was in la i was working at netflix and ultimately saw the opportunity ahead of us in the Midwest is specifically Wisconsin and Madison. Yeah. You know, you look at Raven, who's been around 34 oh, years with Activision's yeah. first acquisition. Wow. Uh, PUBG, one of their main offices, their global creative director is in Madison. Mm-hmm. Lost Boys, which is under yeah. Embracer Group now, they're in Madison. Uh, you have uh, what was... Human Head, right? 
Oh, well, yeah, Human Head and then Roundhouse, and then they turned into Roundhouse, and now they're ZeniMax Online, right. uh, working on Elder Scrolls Online. And then you have EA building a Respawn studio in Madison. Oh, that's well, right. And that's growing tremendously to work on Apex Legends. So you have those five big studios. And then you also have Purblu, which is a homegrown studio that works on you know, one of Disney's largest mobile properties, uh, Disney Heroes. Uh, right, right in Madison as well. So those yeah. those six really create kind of that uh, initial wave, and I think there's only going to be more going into the into that place as mm-hmm. we grow. And then MDev is a great way of collecting that, growing that. And for those that don't know what that is, it's essentially like you can think of it as like the GDC of the Midwest, yeah. and it is an industry focused event that brings together folks from really the middle of the country. And it's just a much more accessible type of event compared to GTC, right. which is rather right. expensive and in San Francisco. And, yeah. you know, so uh, right. MDEV is growing tremendously, uh, doubled attendance last year, which was impressive. Yeah. I sat on a uh, panel around hiring and I had no idea what to expect. And I was impressed. Like I got there and I'm like, wow, there's like eight tracks going on, right? There was like four per side and... There was a lot of people there, more people than I thought. And there were booths and people were hiring. And yeah. I was like, wow, this is a hell of a lot more cost effective than a trip to San Francisco, you, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it was exciting to see that. Uh, I'm, I'm actually helping to organize it this year. Uh, oh, cool. So I was the keynote speaker last year for the event. And we, we had a booth and, you know, we just saw the impressive amount of folks that, that came, the companies that are involved, yep. uh, and the amount of people that even were working remotely at giant companies elsewhere, uh, mm-hmm. which was really impressive. You know, the COO right. of, uh, of um, Second Dinner is right in Madison. Um, hmm. And there's a lot of those kinds of stories of folks that are in Madison and connected to the games industry. And, and ultimately, I think the, the goal this year is to really bring in folks from all around the region Yep. And you know somebody came from Hawaii last year uh, for the <laughs> event, which is which is wild. So I think yeah. it's showing the, the growth and the fact that you can do that full event, travel ticket, hotel, all for under a thousand dollars. Which yeah, looking back, like how did you get involved in the game industry? Like where did you start? So I took a unique route in as you know as a lot of people do. Mm-hmm. I ultimately went to school to go into sports management, scouting, that kind of stuff, uh, and didn't get into that. But I ended up starting a radio station on campus while I was in college. Hmm. And we were the only UW school, University of Wisconsin school, without a radio station. And so that was my first like foot into both entrepreneurial type of activities and into the entertainment space. Because yep. essentially, you know, that's, that's what radio is all about. And so I went to radio for a little bit after college, you know, decided that was not the world I wanted to be in mm-hmm. and connected with a recruiter at 2K that had an opportunity as an, uh, as an operations coordinator available. And I ended up landing the role. They said, hey, can you be out here in two weeks in San Francisco? <laughs> so, yeah, San Francisco so right. And they packed up everything. I moved out. There was, yeah, there was no opportunity for me to do that in the Midwest back right. then. Yeah. So if I, the only opportunity in games was at something like Raven, or there's a lot happening in Chicago. But when I was coming out, like it was the, the kind of the death period of Midway. I was and, there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so ultimately, there wasn't a lot of opportunities, especially in the business space that I was coming from. Yeah. And so that, that was really my entry way in was to go move to San Francisco, go work at 2K, and I started to kind of build my career from there. Cool. And thinking back, like, um, what do you wish you had known about the industry that you know now that you didn't back when you started? That's a great question. I have not been asked, <laughs> asked that question before. You, you know, what, what I wish I knew was that, that this industry changes so incredibly quickly and to embrace the change and be ready, you know, always look on the lookout for the next thing because, you know, this, we adjust, uh, and we, and we pivot. And, you know, since I joined the industry, 
you know, we've we've changed dramatically from a very physical type of space to what the future is going to be, which is a very digital, like completely digitally focused space where right. you know, even the, using anything physical, who knows if controllers will even be a thing or is it just something where, you know, we will have a device that like picks up how our hand movements are and that is the replacement for a controller someday. You know, it's, it's really fascinating going from something that was so physical to so digital. And, you know, you just have to embrace it. Yeah. What about advice you give someone, you know, in 2024 here looking to get their first job in the game industry? I mean, similar to when I came in, you have to be persistent and mm -hmm. uh, you have to be patient. It is ultimately not something that's going to happen overnight. Take the opportunities where they where they exist, you know, and and know that the industry is in a really tough space from a jobs perspective standpoint. Yeah, that doesn't mean that there isn't opportunity. There's plenty of opportunities, but you have to approach it from a standpoint of how do you take the skills you've learned in whatever you're doing. Like when I entered it, it was from radio, but what I was able to sell in that moment was how I took the skills. And my operations ability and facilitation and working across multiple groups and how that translated well into the role I was trying to go for in the industry. And so knowing how to sell yourself and sell uh, the skills that you have are really key to, to giving, getting you that opportunity. And it's probably going to take a number of tries to do it and to not get disheartened by that. That's you know part yeah. of the challenge of getting in. This industry is just harder to get into, right? It's just that's just the reality, right? And it, I think some people are like, oh, I, I went to school, I got my degree, I, I should have offers flooding me, right? It's like, no, no. not so much, <laughs> you know. Um, no, you have yeah. to earn it. Like it, it, yeah. it is, uh, it is an industry that you know. Uh, once you get in, and once you have, you know, a lot of, a lot of you know, network, a lot of the skills built it's easy to navigate between different companies and get mm -hmm. new jobs and, and things like that. I think the unique part about right now is that might not be fully true. Like it used to be, you yeah. know, with, with uh, so many layoffs in such a short period of time, you know, it's, we're just in an odd period. So, we, you know, those that want to stay in the industry or be in the industry have to kind of ride out this period and know that, you know, it's going to adjust. The industry is still growing. It's huge, yeah. but uh, how companies are working and how they're staffing is going to adjust. Um, and so it's like, okay, what skills can you pick up that are part of that next wave of things that these companies are looking at? And yeah. and that will help ultimately get jobs for folks. Yeah, because that kind of ties to my next question, which was like, you know, advice for someone currently working in the industry trying to advance their career. So it's around learning new skills learning mm -hmm. where trends are going stuff like that would yeah. you say yeah you have to really be thinking about okay what what is the next thing that is coming down the line and and how does whatever i'm doing contribute to an overall company you know mm -hmm. especially in this period where companies are prioritizing revenue over you know employees you're yeah. in a position that is generating revenue is is uh you know, is a big piece of the bottom line, you're in a better position. And, right. and, you know, that's not, that's not how you always want to be. You, uh, you know, it's, it is a unique time period, but that's how companies are looking at things. And so mm -hmm. if you can continue to ask for more, ask for new projects and new areas, you know, what, what are the, like, pay attention to what the companies are focused, like focused on, like, what are the big initiatives? If you can always be kind of on that next big initiative, you're not in the thing that has like fallen off of a priority uh, yeah. map. You know, it, that's how a lot of big companies work. And that's how I've kind of built my career is always on the thing that they're building, not the thing that they used to prioritize. Right. And so always yeah. jumping to that next opportunity. And so always looking for that, talking with your managers about it, Saying, hey, like I'm really interested in this new area. I noticed it's growing. Uh, showing that interest really goes a long way because that gets you potentially a foot in the door when they're meeting about, 
you know, building out a new group or things like, oh, you know, they yeah. showed interest in this new area. And then right, you right. are able to potentially get into that area as it's growing. It's always more fun to be part of something that's growing compared to declining. Yeah. And I'm always curious about the topic of change. Like, you know, for you, like, when do you know it's time to make that big change and leave Netflix game group and start Midwest games? Like, like what drove that? You know, there's never, it's never perfect. I think every yeah. move that I've had, you know, you, you go back and you wonder, but what if I didn't move during that? Like what, you know, what would have happened? What could have been, uh, I think about that, you know, when I moved from 2k to blizzard and, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, uh, within, you know, Netflix as well, you know, transitioning between roles and teams. Cause I started the film team at Netflix and helped to build the marketing operations for film. And then yeah. Netflix was like, hey, we want to do game. Right. And so it's always interesting to see, like, did, did you leave the right time into the right roles? Um, but I try to just embrace, you know, change. You have to jump at opportunity. Not every opportunity works, but the mm -hmm. fact that you're jumping at it allows you to continue to grow and advance. So when it mm -hmm. came time, you know, I, uh, we had gotten Netflix games kind of a stable state as far as, like, the current build at that time. Yeah. And, you know, they have a big future roadmap and goals that are really exciting. But for me, I saw, okay, well, how can I create impact in the way that I want to create impact? And for me, going back to where I'm from, uh, being able to build something new or different uh, in a place that needed it most, yeah. uh, it just was the right time for me. And I was like, hey, coming out of COVID, you know, the dust has not settled on on the how the industry has changed you know more remote work than ever before uh, mm -hmm. people move to new locations uh or back to the location they were originally from yeah. like this is a really good time to go build something because the industry is in a really odd state mm -hmm. and so uh it just felt like the timing was right and i knew that i would regret it if i didn't do it now yeah i call that rocking chair regret right like when you're 85 and in a rocking chair you're like damn it i should have done the thing you know and mm -hmm. then you can't right because you yeah. ship sailed um so like what kind of doubts and concerns did you have you had to push through right were you like what if this blows up like like what kind of things were you were you dealing with uh making that big change i mean it it, it really challenges you mentally because uh you have to you question everything you mm -hmm. you know especially like Netflix is like known for like an awesome salary, you know, really rewarding work environment, great culture, and yeah. to just up and leave something like that. I was like, am I crazy to do this? You know, <laughs> right. is yeah. is this the right decision? You know, and then it affects you know your your the folks around you, your family, your loved ones, your your friends. Yeah. And so all of that kind of kind of goes into it. So yeah, you do a lot of uh, soul searching of like is this the right decision? You know, what is the reward for doing this compared to all the challenges ahead? Um mm -hmm. and frankly, you just have to be a little bit naive and not know what the journey is because <laughs> if you knew what the journey was, yeah, you may not do it. Would uh, you, uh, would you yeah, would you still do it? Cuz I think about all the challenges that go into building a business and challenging a norm and putting yourself out there. So we built, you know, pretty in public um, uh, from moment one. You know, from the moment I left Netflix, I announced it exactly our my intentions, what we we're going to build, and we've been pretty public about how we've done each of these things. And there's a toll that comes with that, like you know, a lack of sleep, anxiety. Uh, you know, you have imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, why am I the person that's doing this? Should I be the person that's doing this? Right, right. Uh, you have a lot of those things that, you know, a lot of people don't talk about when they're going through the journey, um, but a, but most of us have it, uh, and it's, it's a lot to overcome, and you feel mm -hmm. very lonely as a founder because you have so much you have to do, so much on your shoulders, people are counting on you, whether yep. it be internally in a company or you know your loved one right uh, and and it becomes a, a major challenge to overcome all of that and so i just look at it like 
on climbing a mountain. And I talk about this with my team a lot where, you know, first off, like when we finally got to the point that we were funded, I'm like, cool, we made it to base camp. Like right, not everyone right. makes it to base camp. Yeah. And you try exactly, to make yeah. it a base camp with as much equipment as, as much as you can possibly right. do. But I'm right. like, and now we climb the mountain. Right. Uh, Sherpa, and, is the Sherpa's good? You, you guys yeah, alive? Yeah, All right. Yeah. yeah, yeah we're we're yeah. going that way. Yeah. And I'm, but I'm like, what the, the key to it is, is it's one step after another. Uh, yeah. You can only take some, some moments, you can only take one step, step forward. And some moments you stagger back a little bit. Uh, yeah. Some moments you, your path you thought was there is no longer there. And you have to adjust on the, on, you know, during, during the climb. And so, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, like focusing on getting to your next step. Uh, and it's amazing because then you look back and you're like, oh, wow, we came really far. Right. Yeah, we have a really long way to go. <laughs> right, right, right. But, but we at least, you know, continued along the climate rather than giving up, you know. Yeah. And, and ultimately, that's what I, I focus on with the team is, is let's, you know, we are going to feel it. There's going to be moments that we feel really down. There's going to be really exciting moments. But we have to keep taking the next step. Otherwise, this thing doesn't move forward. Yeah. And sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back, right? You know, there's yep. setbacks, but then then you get some wind behind your sails and you make, you know, some big leaps. And then every once in yep. a while, you got to like turn around, and look back and go, holy shit, we started down yep. there, right? Yep. You know, and that gives you that that juice to go to the next step and, and stuff. And you, ne- you never know how the weather is going to be. You never know what other factors are going to come into play there's things completely outside your control yeah now we've been you know in, in some ways fortunate that you know uh listen like the industry has shown that it's not sustainable you know twenty thousand plus layoff shows right. that we have areas we need to improve and our whole mission was to look at it and say well, why don't we do it in different places that are more affordable, which fits really well into, right? hey, that's a, we're actively trying to solve a major problem that is really relevant right now uh, in the industry. And that, you know, that's, that's a good thing for our business. Mm -hmm. Now the industry is in, you know, has issues right now, but if we can prove out this is true, we can do this elsewhere that's a great thing because that's going to mean more people are going to take that opportunity, take that chance, do what we're doing. And that mm-hmm. means more jobs uh, right. because it can show that you can have success in these places. And so that's my hope with it. But, you know, you have to be solving a problem. And I think the challenge sometimes in the games industry is we have entrepreneurs, ga- uh, game developers, game publishers that aren't really solving the problem. They yeah. are just, there because games are fun and you can make money off games and you know really you should be thinking about well what does the consumer want what does the industry need how do we solve how do we change um how do we adjust and how Mm -hmm. can we you build a business around that sometimes it's making a game that the consumers want and sometimes making a business that the industry needs yeah and, and in terms of um you know, Midwest Games, I see there's six games on the, uh, you know, the website. Like, what's your advice for, like, a game team who's looking to find a publisher like yourself and who, you know, they have, they got something going and they want to find a publisher? Like, what's your advice around that? Yeah, I mean, make sure you do your research on the publisher. Make sure it's the right one for what you're looking to do. Because mm-hmm. every publisher has a specialization whether it be the amount that they're funding at, you know, some publishers will say, Hey, you know, we do 2 million to $5 million game. You right. know, for us, we're sub million dollar game. So anything that, you know, has a production budget, you know, under a million dollars, we'll, we'll look to do. Um, so understanding that some are genre focused, you know, you look right. at hooded, hooded horse focused really on strategy and they've done yeah. an incredible job at that and are, are an incredible publisher in that space. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and so know your publisher, because if you come at them with a game that just is so far outside of what they do, um, it's really hard. Now you can't always tell every factor. And so, you know, if it looks like you fit, absolutely submit it. Now, the hard truth that a lot of developers don't love to hear is that the publisher, the publisher, like developer dynamic is very unfair in the publisher's advantage yeah. because there's so few publishers 
um, with with uh, a constrained amount of money that they can spend and a constrained amount of uh, portfolio that they can add over time. And then there's so many developers with so many games right, right. that the supply demand is out of whack, which is why I'm a big advocate that we need more publishers uh, and more competition in that space. Now, right. the reason it's still a better formula than self-publishing is just in the data. You, yeah. Like, uh, publishers know how to cut through at vastly greater rate than uh, developers can do themselves because you know it's, it's ultimately the teams the skills that are needed mm. like to develop a game it's a whole set of skills to put out a game and market a game and release management qa localization everything that's involved in publishing is yeah. a whole other set of skills and some folks might learn pieces of all of those those skills but it's always better to go to the table with larger teams more support the more power you can go behind launch, the better chance you have at the right. launch. And that's why, you know, developers with publishers have a, a large, a large foot up over just folks trying to go it alone. Um, right. And so it just creates a really tough dynamic for a lot of developers uh, that are looking for a publisher. So just know that going in, uh, but how you reach them is in any way you can possibly reach them. And sometimes their forums and their website. I recommend LinkedIn. Like that's a yeah easier way to get directly to the key decision makers. Um, and you want to go after key decision makers. Like those are the folks that if you get them excited about your game. They advocate for your game, and they can actually be the ones that make a decision and say, "Hey, we should go after it." And yeah. so try to get to those folks. It's very similar to like venture capital. You want to get to the the main partner. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, because that they're the decision maker. Right, and they'll remove obstacles to push things along. Where, yeah, yeah, it makes a difference. And uh, yeah, in terms of um, you know publishers too. Right, there's different genres, different like f I had someone from was it Fear Demic, um, and they specialize just in like horror games. Right, like mm. it's just the, you know that niche. Yeah. You, you know, so it's like going out there finding all those different publishers and then figuring out which are the best to approach and. Then, you know, going on the website, because I, I saw on your website, you know, it's, hey, if you have a game to submit, you know, click a button here yeah. and, yeah. you know, and do that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, because we're genre agnostic, so we don't have right. a, a, a key focus. Now, we'll look at all the data around a certain genre, opportunity, and then we look at our portfolio and, and you know, weighing too much in one area isn't something we're looking to do, but we're mm -hmm. looking to build upon games over time. So right. someone could look at our current portfolio and know, Hey, we have a kind of JRPG deck builder called Dark Sky, and it's this incredible game. It's going to come out this fall, and you know, once we put out that game, we will want to do something that is similar after it at some point. So, mm -hmm. if we get pitched, uh, you know, games in that are RPGs or you know, uh, especially turn-based RPGs, uh, that would be really beneficial because we've already built an audience for one game. We can help serve it to another game. Um, so that's another way is like look and understand what they've published before and yeah. see if it complements, see what you, if your game complements what they published and then that helps your game because you have built-in audiences with a publisher that can, can, can help bring it to your game. Yeah, and just going on your own totally on your own right and like trying to do all the marketing and you know there's so many gazillion games on steam every year right it's like yeah, 14, how, how do you stand plus. It? fourteen thousand plus yeah that's what billy said in the last one right you know it's fourteen thousand yep. games and you know it seems like and i'm not huge on the steam side but one of the big keys is like getting that wish list yep. number up right and the, the, and whatever you can do to drive that wish list and, and partnering with someone to get that wish list number up that's going to help equate yeah. some level of success of course you have yeah. to a good game but yeah well game, but, so yeah. there's a couple things with that that the wish list number literally you get to a certain threshold and that is what allows you to get into the algorithm in a larger way and get the mm. promotion that you need right so you have to get to a certain certain level and then it's the greatest indicator of interest mm. uh in your game now I've seen so many different curves, like sales curves and, and you know, people uh, like, what is your percentage of folks you can convert from a wish list to a sale? You know, I've right. seen everything from like 
80 90 percent like conversion rate to like five percent conversion rate right yeah, it's, anyone it's like huge. convert <laughs> and uh you know or or even less at times you know if it's it's really not what people thought it was going to be oh, um and yeah. and also you know with team you can play for two hours before uh and and then return it yeah um so you you have to deliver upon what you're promising otherwise as much as it looks like a sale, guess what? It's a return as well. And yeah. you're going to see that um, later. And so, yeah. It's Probably a, really, a negative review on, on top of it. And a negative turn. review. Yeah. yeah. And, that, yeah. and then that's going to kill you too because the reviews help. It, you know, there's a lot of like algorithm um, pieces that you have to understand with something like theme that, uh, that affect things. Now, push just are one indicator, but others are like, social so off of platform yeah. how is how much interest are you driving you know and, and somebody like billy like had an awesome publisher behind them uh big mode and you know video game dunking and everything yeah, that they yeah, do and massive. they they're able to immediately serve it to an awesome audience that's really interested in the game and you know video game dunking can speak to that game and that audience so authentically like it's not doing a sales pitch yeah uh it is authentic because you know he cares about the game he cares about the developer um and in is talking you know in exactly his style um mm -hmm. of uh of reviews and and promotions and so yeah. it works really well when you can do something like that and because it's authentic and that's what yeah. you know especially gamers want they don't want some bullshit marketing yeah exactly they want something that's authentic right yeah they had decades of bullshit marketing right you, yeah. you know and it's like Hey, if you're enjoying this, can you click on the like and subscribe buttons for me? It'll really help out. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I could I could tell you stories. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, no, yeah. No. <laughs> I know all too well. I mean, I've seen I've seen it, you know, games yeah. that are deceptive and how they promote themselves uh, so that they can get a sale. And I just don't think you, it, that works these days. You know, you, right. the marketing is so important. But you can't just do lazy marketing. You can't just try to pretend something, you know, is what it isn't. Because you're not you're not at a place where somebody's going to buy something and then they can't return it. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're at a place yeah. where they will, yeah, they will come back. And if you do it well, they will come back and they will reward you over and over. And so take right. your time, make sure you put out the best possible product. And, you know, position it the right way. Don't try to position it as something that it really isn't. Position it what it is. And it will, and like there's audiences out there that will love that for what it is. Right. Um, if you position it correctly. Right. There's like this whole, you know, the simulator market, you know, with, with yeah. all these, like, don't try and say what it's not. Like there, there's, there's an audience for whatever, yes. you know, grocery store simulator, whatever the hell yep. thing there is. He, you Wasn't know. like stock market simulator. <laughs> yes, yeah, one one that just took off. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's, it's 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 wild to think of all these like subgenres and niche 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 down and things that are going mm -hmm. on. But yeah, you, you know, in olden days, you would pay blur to make this kick-ass video that yep. nothing representing the game. It was just like yeah. this exciting video, and then. Uh, you would try and sell the game that way and just have that video as a TV commercial and then uh, everyone yeah. returns the games and they get shipped back and then the company blows up. But uh, yep. yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's a different time, different era for, for marketing. Um, and there's good ways to do it and there's bad ways to do it still. Yeah. Uh, but, but my biggest thing is be authentic to what it is. Um, you know, it, it's tough. When you get down to it, like, you want to make something work. Mm -hmm. And you, you, and some folks get desperate and, and want to like right. just do whatever to make it work. And it's, it's like, is that really the, the best thing to do? Cause I look at it as like a long-term reputation thing. If you, mm -hmm. you do that, yeah, you might, you might get away with it once and you might make some money off of it, but it's going to tarnish your reputation over time. Yeah. And that's so, so important because people remember that right. stuff and you have to, I just believe so strongly you have to be authentic with, with how you're putting it out, uh, you know, your marketing materials, you know, and, and just just the who you're bringing on to represent 
your brand like you know mm -hmm. we've all seen the the stupid mobile mobile commercials of some game with some big celebrity and they just throw it in the midst right. of some some random mobile game it's right. just silly uh and yeah. it, i just don't think it's that's the kind of industry that people actually want yeah well, people are more sophisticated right like yeah. you know maybe there's a fraction of the market you can just bamboozle but for the most part you know real gamers are more sophisticated and they're not going to get oh arnold schwarzenegger was in this ad so i must play this mobile game now right you know they get they're too wise for that and, and they read reviews and they see what people are doing and they look yeah. at social so you can't get away with the bullshit like you used to um which yeah is good. And, and it's uh, good yeah it's the right. good thing that the that bullshit is ending and that uh you know, you just have to be more clever. You have to come up with unique ways to market things, and people can do it. Like, yeah, if Liquid Death can figure out how to market <laughs> water like it's, you know, the best energy drink in the world. Like, you know, uh, any people can come come up with ways to market what is yeah. really cool is video games. Like, yeah, they right want to do it. Yeah, I, God, sorry, but yeah, I saw it was like nine hundred seventy million dollar company. You know, and I'm like, it's it's water, right? And it's, and the, the one that kills me is like. All right, you're at a concert. You don't want to have beer or whatever or yeah. drinks. You know, all right, I'll pay seven dollars for the water. When they sell it at the grocery store, you're like, what? Like, yeah, <laughs> you can. I mean, you're not. You're not tied to the it's, venue. Where you it's branding. I mean, I the mean, branding's I'm, amazing. I'm yeah. drinking a Coke right now. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> it was proven over and over that Pepsi tastes better than Coke, right? Yeah, and, but, my Apple logo. But yet, yeah, but yet yeah. people are still, you know, uh, Coke wins every time. And yeah, yeah. Branding matters, and uh, you know, and and I, th I think games has a lot to learn from a lot of other industries, you know, mm -hmm. and people are just being really smart about it. You know, Liquid Death is one example, but you look at Maximum Effort and all the stuff that Ryan Reynolds' agency is doing. Or oh, his yeah. stuff or other stuff um it's really impressive he's able to take things that you know that you know mint mobile mint mobile uh, yeah exactly they, they exactly. bought and then he was able to like turn this thing that no one knew what it was yeah. into this like thing that we're like oh yeah mint mobile yeah, yeah. um he it's sold so, it for billions to um yeah. the pink yeah. phone logo company wherever the hell that is yeah, yeah yeah so it's it's we have a lot to learn in games um, and, and start treating like our games and the IP like true IP, valuable IP that can grow over time. A lot yeah. of times we treat it like it's something that is one and done, when in reality, the minute you put out a game, you suddenly have something of value. That IP, the intellectual yeah. property, has a value to it. Now, sometimes it's really small if you don't get a very good audience to start, but it is still something. Yeah. And it's something build upon and grow upon and it's something that you know if you do it right you can position and it can go into other mediums um and be a film and be yeah. a no, toy right. be other right. thing if you grow it um in the right way yeah and, and yeah just to plug the old game i worked on you know mortal Kombat, right L like look at that right like that thing just grew and grew but there was ed and the team were very they were very careful about it like they didn't want crap coming out and stuff but yeah it if you grow a valuable ip and you have the right people uh, it's huge right and it can go for decades yeah. and decades and decades um so yeah. you have to think of it that way you have to think long term not like how can i make a quick buck yep. and uh trick somebody you know yep. it's just... and the best ips do it right you know one yeah. of my favorites of all time is teenage mutants turtles and they yeah. started as a black and white comic and right. gr and grew over time you know, and now they're in so many different means. They're doing, you know, really fun, kid-friendly stuff, and then they're doing really dark stuff. And yeah. so it's, you know, it's it's cool to see that grow, but there's going to be something that I think grows in this era that, you know, we look at 20 years from now, and yeah. it's one of the top big, like, IPs in, in the world. Because I think with all the layoffs, with everything, like, we've sent out a lot of creative folks and some of them are going to go create and create new right. things, create yeah. new IP. So right now in this time frame, I think we're going to look back and there's going to be a lot that comes out of this. Now, mm -hmm. it may, it'll take years for us to really see it and for it to become really big IP, like 10 plus years. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think we're going to see a lot that comes from this era. No, which is exciting, right? Like, wow, all these people are like, 
I got time now. I'll show you. I'm going to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Up they got a chip thing. in their shoulder as well. Yeah. That's the, that's right. the best way. Like yeah. have a creative with a chip on his shoulder, uh, his <laughs> right. or shoulder and, and, uh, see what, see what happens. Yeah. Like the, the wrath is coming, right? Like, yeah. 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 Creative with a chip. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what's been like one or two of your favorite games or projects to work on? I mean, you know, one of my, one of the first, uh, big ones that I worked on was Borderlands two. Mm. Um, and That's that cool. one, that was just such a fun, like, you know, bizarre oh, yeah. <laughs> marketing and, uh, just game and universe. And now it's right. funny. I, I remember we, you know, we had signed with, you know, to have a movie while I was still at 2k. But like, that's how long ago that we, oh, wow. that. Right, right. and now it's, now it's right. finally going to come out um, this this long uh, after, and so yeah, so that one was really incredible to work on. You know, something that I mean, I worked on so many games at at Netflix, trying to bring them onto the platform, right? Um, and one that like, you know, I'm really uh, really proud of that we were able to to get and it was my you know my idea to bring it on now i didn't do the work to, to actually get it there where a lot of others did but into the mm. breach is one of my favorite pc games um of all time and to see it come to mobile was super exciting and it was funny because we were like you know it was uh early on in the initiative and i was just was like hey we should get into the breach on this like this would be awesome yeah and they ran with it and did it and it, so so that one was cool. was cool to be a part of, especially since it added a bunch of new content as well when oh. it launched on Netflix. And then also that content became free for people on PC. Uh, so that was That's really nice. cool. So that was a fun project. Um, and then like, you know, the one that uh, that was just really just wild was working on the Mafia 3 campaign. Because we mm. did so many really cool um things and moments with that and you know and it was such a different kind of world and campaign uh because it wasn't a traditional mafia game you know you were reading yeah. uh the 1960s 1968 in the south and you played as a you know black protagonist uh hmm. and you know it was it was just the, the story the music the vibe like um, was just really impressive what the team was able to accomplish, and you know, with with a fairly small team, you know, in comparison to, you know, you look at big open world games like right. GTA and the massive amount of team that they have. Like the, that team was not very big, and they, so they did a lot with a little. Yeah. Um, and so getting to work on that and see that all the way through during my time at 2K, and then it come out and it didn't perform as well in market as. You know, I think uh, folks were thinking it would um, yeah. uh, out in out in you know press and the public, but still, like it was a heck of an accomplishment for essentially like a, a newer studio, Hangar Thirteen, uh, to put out. Oh right, yeah, yeah, they were like West Coast, right? So, yeah, yeah, they were they were like right with the publishing unit. There, a lot of it was like created off of former uh, LucasArts folks that mm-hmm. you know, because when when LucasArts shut down. Yeah. Um a bunch came over um and worked at 2K. Yeah. All right. Um what are you curious about right now in this changing industry we're in like kind of touched about a little bit earlier but like any thoughts? Yeah, I mean with chaos pre- brings like opportunity and mm-hmm. so with all of this change is a lot of opportunity to do new things, challenge uh the ways of the past. And I just think we're entering in this, you know, new digital age uh, that is is exciting. Cloud is coming, you know, whether it's five to ten years from now, it's right. coming. And people, you know, the the fact that you will be able to play any game anywhere on any device with anyone is a really exciting thing. Accessibility of games in the same way that streaming is so accessible. Uh, these days, and so I think that part is is really um, really exciting because it, I think it's going to give more opportunities, especially like in the early days of cloud and whatnot. 
like the experiences have to be smaller. So I think it's going to create a lot of opportunity for indie developers to create really new, unique experiences. Um, and that's fun. Like that is, that is, uh, exciting. You know, I haven't, I, you know, I remember the hope and idea of like something like, uh, connect, like Xbox, yeah, connect. like people yeah. thought were like, Oh my God, like, look at this thing. Now it didn't turn out into it, but there's a lot of like really fun and interesting things that happened off of that yeah. era. Uh, and so my hope is that, you know, as we move into this, this new space, that people are going to be really innovative, um, mm-hmm. in, in how we approach it and you know with constraint allows for you know this really uh you know doing a lot in that constraint you know in the same way of how video games was born like a lot of game developers in the early days they were constrained right like yeah, a lot exactly. of the art the art that we love <laughs> only existed because they couldn't do yeah you know the kind of art that you know they wanted to do yeah uh, exactly. and so i think it's going to create another like constrained era I think creatives are going to do amazing things in it. What are your thoughts around AR, VR, MR, you know, that whole space? you have any exposure opinions? Yeah, I mean, it's exciting, but until, you know, it's you know, the size of the glasses you have on right now and, and everything right. um, is easier to uh, experience longer sessions of gameplay, it's always going to be tough. It's always going to right. be the equivalent of, yeah, I can watch a movie for you know, two hours, uh, but, you know, to, but I can game for eight straight hours for 10 straight yeah, hours. Right, like, right, but yeah. I'm not going to do that with a headset on. Like that's, uh, yeah, you know, that's, yeah. but if, you know, if there's an easier way to, to do it and, and again, some people will, but I think if you want to hit the like bigger audience, the bigger global audience, it has to be just very easy to use. So I'm a big believer in the future of it. I just yeah. don't think we're, remotely there yeah 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 we, yeah still ways to go is kind of what you're thinking yeah yeah and then the sixty four thousand dollar question like what are your thoughts about ai right like AI. Uh, going out with that uh, there's gonna be a lot of lawsuits uh <laughs> and that's gonna that's gonna determine a lot of the direction with it like there's gonna be people that are challenging it lawsuits that happen and then there's gonna be some kind of middle ground that exists in it but it's the problem is that the legal system it's always going to move so much slower than yeah. the technology. And right. so uh, it will never truly be able to solve the complexity of this. You know, from a, from a business standpoint, there's lots of opportunities for better efficiencies. Um, but from a creative standpoint, you know, it, AI can't do what, like, you know, somebody can create themselves. Like, it just, mm-hmm. it, it isn't there. Now, like, they can create some really odd crazy thing especially right now right and it will improve over time yeah definitely but, improve. you know I, I think it helps with concepting and getting someone's yeah. ideas into a semi like closed space but i think beyond that um mm-hmm. I, I struggle uh to see it being a replacement for things mm-hmm. um but does it help us iterate faster yeah i mean yeah. It, it absolutely does that and i think that's where the value should be it yeah. helps us move a little bit faster, but you know, if if people's goals are to replace artists, like what's the point in what we're doing? Like, yeah, like right. the whole point is is to create entertainment and be a human. It's like it's mm. uh, not to automate every single thing in our life. You know, yeah, there's just it's how do we make things efficient that we really don't want to do? No one wants to be doing. <laughs> like those are the right. things that we should be automating. Now, the creative thing, those are the things we should be spending more time on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have a buddy um, from Midway who was an artist who transitioned into film and, and writing and directing. And um, he had talked about how he used to have a writing partner and now AI is his writing partner. So like he uses it for bouncing mm-hmm. ideas, right? You, you know, mm-hmm. and he's feeding things in and he gets ideas back. So he kind of collaborates with it, right? Yep. He's not like, write me a script. Yeah. you know send but it's 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 kind of this uh, creative process now and having someone else to bounce ideas off of uh being ai but yeah it's it's not replacing the, the process yeah. but, you know stuff like I that mean, is kind of cool yeah i mean i had it you know early on as i was like thinking through what do i name the company what it like what is our logo what is our oh, like right. mm-hmm. and like thinking through just what could that even be like what is representative what is not out there what is 
you know, and so it, it hel- yeah, it helps me, helped me think through things so much faster than if I just was, you know, Google searching Google. every single thing. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's where the value is. Now, at the end of the day, I came up with a very unoriginal name for my company, Midwest Games. <laughs> uh, and it, but it ultimately, yeah, it's clear. And that's, that's yeah. the thing. It's like, that's where I'm like, you know, I can come up with all the clever names, but right. it muddles what we do. Like, where everyone knows what we do do you know for the most mm. part like publisher developers some people don't understand the difference but like yep. midwest games like that we you know we where we are what we do is right there um what's a funnier odd story from working in the industry about a project or anything that you're want to share uh fun or odd story you know um a, a really interesting one was you know, I was, I was where I can't say what the title was because yeah, we never, we didn't, we didn't uh, actually complete it. But I got put on this, this pitch uh, one time to help, like pitch and try to get this, this license for a title, and um, you know, and it was the weirdest, like most fun, like month, uh, two months of my life, um, mm-hmm. where I essentially just like dropped everything else for the most part. Yeah. Um, and just focused on this, and you know, we we built out this um, this whole pitch in a giant warehouse, and we built out the game in a warehouse, in and a warehouse, like in, in a, wow. like a phys- like a physical space, and we showed like the game and like how it would be, you know, wow. brought through folks through it, and it was just super weird, but like, <laughs> but you know, it, it worked, like it. it it did the trick it did exactly what we were aiming to do with it and to get these folks to visualize what we would do and how we would do it mm-hmm. um and it was just such a fun and unique project you know you don't often uh get told hey we're going to rent out a, a warehouse in new york and build out the game physically uh, <laughs> For uh people so that, to that, experience so that people can physically. yeah so that people can it can represent what this game would be if we did it and so that was a fun a fun experience wow sounds almost like an escape room or something yeah uh, yeah, yeah in, in a way <laughs> yeah huh that's cool um what about a game you're playing right now that you're excited about or enjoying or games or anything like that well a couple things that i'm playing or always come back i mean starfield i just keep coming back to mm. i love i love space i love uh, I love everything Bethesda does. I get some yeah. people's complaints with it, but it's it's like my it's my jam in in some ways. And being able to just escape and frankly, like people complain about being bored, it's fine. Like you know, yeah. sometimes you need that like yeah, it, escape, go in the ship, like travel, do mindless mindless things a little bit, and advance your character. Yeah. Um. So that uh. The game that I always come back to, or every every so often come back to, RimWorld, um, just such a mm. such a fantastic uh, colony uh, simulation. Um, I mean, it's really what they sell it as the story a storytelling simulator. Yeah. Um, but what it is is a colony builder, um, but it has a lot of random shit happening all the time. Yeah, um, so just keeps it interesting. Ab- yeah, absolutely love that game. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, I've been playing uh, a bunch of Hive Jump to Survivors, which is one of our games um, hmm. as well. And so, you know, it's like Vampire Survivors uh, meets like a Helldivers world, like take, oh. taken over by bugs. And you have to, you know, you're this hell, like this, uh, this uh, Hive Jump Marine that is trying to survive. Um, and, you know, it has the auto shooter mechanics, but then there's like a jetpack as well that allows you to kind of get around the map really quickly um and so it's just a it, you know for for a way to kind of both feed uh, a desire to kind of relax and do something that's you know you, you're escaping constantly yeah. and um but also the progression system of being able to progress uh multiple different attributes with your character to unlock mm-hmm. new characters um yeah. uh it's, it's good and so that one, that one's in early access right now, um, and uh, and me and some of the team can't get enough of that. Cool. Anything I should have asked you about, but didn't. My uh, 
uh, CMO likes to put on our website, you know, you should ask Ben about ski ball. So I guess that would be the one that you should have asked me about. <laughs> ski ball. Didn't. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm a I'm a huge fan of ski ball. Actually, like redemption ticket ski ball. We you, you yeah, yeah, yeah yeah yeah. I used okay. to used to even play professionally because there is actually a professional ski ball league. Really. Um. And uh. Yeah. Uh. People have their ski ball names. I'm Wisconski. Uh. My wife is <laughs> ski rack. You know, we used to roll against the back seat boys, and uh, one of my teammates was Cardi Ski. Uh, uh-huh. so a big fan, a big fan of ski ball, um, and it wow. you know it comes full circle because the folks that manufacture ski ball are in Wisconsin. Oh, uh, okay. Baytech Entertainment, and so um, it's it's fun that uh, and and full circle is a, a ski ball pun as well. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, so yeah, big fan of that. I have a ski ball machine in my garage uh, in my LA home. Um, uh-huh. And then uh, in Green Bay, in our office here, uh, there's ski ball machines as well. Damn, no, that's cool. Yeah, it. Uh, yeah, I remember going to Kings Island uh, a long time ago with some friends and pouring money, 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 getting those tickets and got like a beer mug or something. But yeah, it was. Yeah. You yeah. know, you're like, oh, I got the center, I, I got the big one. You know, um, <laughs> I, I didn't realize there was a community around that, but it makes sense. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's a game of skill. Yeah. It's you played with people. It's, yeah. you know, it was on the ESPN uh, the Ocho one one year <laughs> oh, really? as well. So yeah, right. so you know when when they turned ESPN two into the Ocho, uh, I was actually featured one year. Really? Wow, that's it's, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's more entertaining watching curling and stuff. So why the hell not, right? Yeah, so, right. Um, Anything I can, I, any sport I can uh, have a have a beer with. Uh, yeah, right. it's worked by me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, mixes it up. So where can people find you online, like website, social, stuff like that? Yeah, for company-wise, MidwestGames.com. Uh, and you can find us at Midwest Games or Midwest Games Co. on a lot all the social you know, channels. And then me individually, uh, LinkedIn is my most active, uh, just my name, Ben Qualo. Uh, and uh, I'm also on Twitter a little bit, a little bit more of my unhinged thoughts on twitter uh yeah. or sports thoughts or game thoughts or you know you never yeah. know on that um and so uh yeah it's again ben follow pretty rare name so it's easy to find me right yeah and then just last question like what's one piece of advice you give others working in the industry right now with everything going on network network yeah. community build uh you know don't let the chaos get to you focus in on where you're going where you're trying to go and to connect with others that are going to going to help you along the way there's a lot of people out there that want to help yeah. and and how you get to those and you network but network authentically uh mm-hmm. connect with people authentically don't just try to be somebody that takes from one another like right. give back to um be there for one another connect them with somebody else that you know offer support offer help uh, mm-hmm. And it's amazing how many times it comes back, you know, and, and helps you as well. And so networking yep. is, is, I think, the biggest key to my success in my career is just networking with with folks and creating genuine connection. Yeah, no, exactly. I thousand percent agree with that. So well, cool. Well, thanks for being on tonight. I really enjoyed this. This has been fun. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, John. I really appreciate it.